จทย์วันนี้เราจะมาฟังมุมมองจากผู้สื่อข่าวต่างชาตินะคะที่ติดตามสถานการณ์ทุกๆสถานการณ์ที่เกิดขึ้นในประเทศไทยนะคะไม่ว่าจะเป็นเรื่องของการเมืองเศรษฐกิจหรือสังคมกับผู้สื่อข่าวสองท่านนะคะเพื่อให้มองประเมินในรอบหนึ่งปีที่ผ่านมากับเหตุการณ์ที่กําลังเกิดขึ้นในไทยนะคะรวมถึงฉายภาพว่าเขามองจุดยืนของประเทศไทยในภูมิภาคอย่างไรนะคะท่านแรกค่ะคุณนิมอลกอชค่ะเป็นผู้สื่อข่าวของหนังสือพิมพ์สเตรทไทม์จากประเทศสิงคโปร์เป็นคนเชื้อสายอินเดียนะคะทำงานในเมืองไทยมา9ปีแล้วค่ะอีกท่านค่ะคุณมาวันมากันมาคาเป็นคนศรีลังกานะคะเป็นนักข่าวที่ติดตามสถานการณ์ในไทยอย่างต่อเนื่อง10ปีค่ะวันนี้จะมาพูดคุยกันนะคะ Hello thank you both of you for joining us first of all I'd like you to tell me what is the most Interesting news story. If you were to choose one, the most significant, the most interesting, the most important news story for you, Mawan. Uh, for this year, I yes. think uh, Thailand's political transition. Uh, you know, you had uh, the election this in in the middle of the year, so it's going through a, fe- a period of political transition, uh, and how Thailand succeeds or whether it succeeds is certainly what. Uh, You know, I consider uh, a major story. For you, it's election, and you, Nimo. For me, also, I would say the elections because it was a signal to uh, uh, return to the process for Thailand, and yet also it was part of uh, the general dynamic, political dynamic. It moved Thailand on a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I mean, a close second, I would say, was would be the flood disaster already. Although people, some mm-hmm. people have forgotten about it already, mm-hmm. but that did raise. Long-term implications of a difficult, of a different kind mm-hmm. for Thailand and for Bangkok to to handle, which yes. will outlive politics. You also covered the new story of the riots during May, April and May 2010, and I saw you around a lot when we were during the field work. Professionally, what's the difference between last year and this year as a journalist? Well, I mean, the last year clearly when the riots occurred, it showed that. Political differences uh, that had to spill out onto the street. Yeah, uh, what we see this year is political differences are still contained within Parliament. I mean, it's a sign of a uh, you know vibrant democracy. Mm-hmm. Is you have to have political differences, right? But then there's a space for that to be discussed in a more civil fashion, and Parliament provides that. So uh, you know the fact that from the street you have come back to Parliament is a good sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But does that mean Thailand has uh, moved on, and we're not going to see the we're not going to see street protests? I don't think so, because you know now with this whole concern and the debate in the Thai media about Les Majest, uh, you are seeing protests. You know, a uh, couple of days ago you had a group led by Dr. Tun, mm-hmm. who was quite angry at the international reaction. And protested uh, outside the U.S. Embassy mm-hmm. and the U.N. And a week before that, you had another group of people who were sympathetic to our grandfather SMS, o n c l e SMS, uh, for his 20-year, uh, you know, jail term. Yes. And they gathered at Victoria Monument and marched towards Rajiv Gandhi. So uh-huh. these are hints of street protests, different issue, but yeah. it shows that uh, you know we might not see the last of, last of mm-hmm. street protests. Clearly, regarding this Majestic Law, you must have seen the difference between at least two groups of people. One group, lot of people, see it's necessary to remain this Majestic Law because it's necessary for Thai for Thai society. But the other group see it as it can be exploited. Well, I th- I mean, as a journalist, for me, uh, it's rather remarkable that you're having this discussion in public. As you know, uh, I think uh, before before the coup, uh, if journalists. Had to pursue stories on Les Majes. It is almost impossible to get Thais to speak out openly about it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there was a sense of fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since the coup, that uh, climate of fear has broken down, and uh, now the cases have increased. Of course, so that's a negative. That's a disturbing f- sign, right? I mean, last year there were f- almost 478 Les Majes cases, uh-huh. right? Which is huge. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's a public debate. And that's a welcome sign, and makes it easy for journalists to report this story. Mm-hmm. What about you, Nimo? Yeah, I would basically agree with what Marwan is saying. Uh, I think there's there's unprecedented the scope of the scale of the, of the discussion is unprecedented. Uh, a lot of it does take part, uh, does take place in private, 
because of the of the of the law itself mm -hmm. but uh, in general uh, i think the boundaries of uh, discourse have, have have been expanded dramatically in the last yes. five or six years mm -hmm. so it's uh, it's it's quite an interesting time as a foreign journalist who has been working here for nine years like you how has the least majest law been obstacle to your work i don't see it as an obstacle but it is it is something one is conscious of because of the way it has been used Um, uh, two, three years ago, for example, the board, the Foreign Correspondents Club, someone complained, lodged a complaint, uh, unless it is a complaint against the entire board of the FCCT. Mm -hmm. And that eventually didn't go any further. There were no merit was found in it, I believe. But uh, that kind of action does make you think twice mm -hmm. and be a little extra careful. Especially if one is on the social media, for example, if someone makes uh, a comment or something, one has to be careful how one responds. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't call it an obstacle in my reporting. It's just that because of the proliferation of social media and because one, is, as a foreign journalist, to some extent, you're a public figure. People watch what you're doing. Uh, you have to keep it in mind. Professionally, in the past three years, a few years, do you feel much more challenged? As a foreign journalist in Thailand, because you see what the political division is, how the country is divided. For you, how is it professionally? Yes, I do feel uh, more challenged because, in a sense, the more you know, the less you know. Uh, the, the more you go into the complexities, the more complex it becomes. Uh -huh. And that I think is true for many countries, but Thailand especially, because Thailand can be deceptive. There's lots of things you know, below the surface. Mm -hmm. What you see is not always. What is actually going on behind the scenes, which uh -huh. is more important than the action on the streets. So you can get get carried away, uh, reporting and uh, analyzing what you can see in front of you, uh -huh. and yet you have to go behind the scenes. That's always challenging, right? Do you have to notify the editor in Singapore to be very careful on headlines or anything when referring to Thailand? Yes, I I do that on a regular basis and. Um, Most of the time, if time allows it, my story is sent back to me. If there's changes in it, so I check the changes and make sure there are no mistakes. Because sometimes someone who's not familiar with Thailand doesn't know a particular term or something, and you know, a mistake mm -hmm. comes in. So hopefully, we get most of them. Yeah, m a w a n have you ever been asked what color are you? <laughs> uh, no, no, I haven't been asked. Uh, but uh, I remember when. Uh, I mean, the, I was the president of the FCCT uh, for two years, 2009-2010. Yes. That was a period when there was intense political uh, clashes between the red shirts, uh, the yellows, and the Democrats in government. And the FCCT was accused of having a pro-red shirt bias. You know, uh, that's the closest mm -hmm. I've had to somebody. Making that allegation, but in in a situation, is it true? no, it's not true. I mean, it's uh, basically in in a situation like that, we say, look, the space is open for all views, uh -huh. and we've encouraged all the views, and we have had some great nights where people who are sympathetic to the mm -hmm. yellow shirt view mm -hmm. uh, or the Democrat Party view came and gave their position. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I mean, it's I for uh, in in my case, uh, the kind of stories I look for. Sometimes it might be sympathetic to the underdog, the marginalized groups, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because they are not. And those mean red. Well, I mean, people. you know, it can be anybody. You know, it can be somebody in the south of Thailand, mm -hmm. or it can be victim of drug, uh, you know, toxins, uh, war on drugs. You know, mm -hmm. where he killed 2,500 people. So, I mean, IPS as a news agency, we try to be give space and voice to those people. So. Yeah, I think during the clashes between the red shirts and the Democrat Party government, uh, you know, we were certainly trying to listen to the people on the street. Mm -hmm. So it's the job of FCCT to open to every view. FCCT, yeah, it's. I mean, that, I mean, look, my job is one thing. FCCT is quite another, right? But the FCCT is, believes that it has mm -hmm. to be a space for all the views, and we certainly did that uh, mm -hmm. during that phase and mm -hmm. continue to do so. You were also the president of FCCT before. Were you l a b e l as any coloured side before? No, I think um, there was a general perception among some quarters that the that the foreign media in general is pro red shirt. I was told that by government officials, but um, I didn't agree because. What uh, year you were told? 
Oh, this was, I think, a couple of years ago, three uh -huh. years, three, two to three years ago. Uh -huh. Was it formal complaint? No, 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 it wasn't formal. It was just an impression. Uh, people came to me and said, oh, the foreign media is pro Russia. Uh -huh. But um, I, I didn't agree. And for the simple reason that, A, the foreign media is not just monolithic. It's not just the BBC, CNN. It, it's, it's Chinese media, Japanese media, uh -huh. South American news agency, Straits Times, Singapore. So there's a whole plethora, there's a whole range of media out there. So you can't sort of stereotype it as foreign media. Mm -hmm. And then you also can't stereotype it as Western media, you know. So people look at the situation from different points of view. And um, I think a lot of the people who were accusing the foreign media of biases were actually seeing the coverage through the prism of their own biases. Mm -hmm. They're saying, you know, things like, why didn't you report that? Why didn't you report this? And why did you give that person airtime and not the other person? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a reflection of their own biases, basically. For the future of Thailand, election must be marked as a turning point this year. How do you think? Definitely. I think it was, as I said before, a return to some sort of process, a parliamentary you know, democratic process. And it was always, it's always a good bet to go back to the people. I mean, Thailand labels itself a democracy, aspires to greater democracy. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep going back to the people for the mandate. So in that sense, it, it certainly brought back uh, a sense of some normal process and it secured a mandate for the government mm -hmm. and the government was allowed to, uh, to take power and function and uh, so far so good I mean there are complaints and there's there's a background static and there's mm -hmm. uh, issues the hangover of the political crisis the polarization is still very much there and will probably I think next year come up a little bit more you know as as people near get closer to sensitive issues uh -huh. But um, in and of itself, I think this year you have to, I would, one would say, is a positive year for Thailand because it was a successful election. There was no widespread violence. There was no widespread uh, sort of vote rigging or fraud or anything. Everybody Politically. accepted the result. Mm -hmm. So, positive. With political deeply divided in Thailand, people even say that we are patient of Asia. Do you agree with that? Uh, look, I think that's an unfair. Calling Thailand the sick patient of Asia, I think mm -hmm. is a bit unfair, right? Because you would look at the other countries in Southeast Asia to realize that all have their problems. Uh, Thailand is important for the region because it's the second largest economy. Mm -hmm. Its location is in the center of mainland Southeast Asia. So anything that happens to Thailand, I think will impact the region much wider and greater than any of the Southeast Asian countries. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so Thailand, I think all the other countries around Southeast Asia, sorry, in Southeast Asia, around Thailand, are looking at Thailand much more closely. Uh, but Thailand has problems. I mean, it has uh, dropped from being a beacon of free expression in the region, uh, say, six, seven years ago, mm -hmm. to one, having one of the worst records. Uh, if you look at the... So Thailand can no, no longer boast about it? No, Indonesia has taken over. So right now, Indonesia has become almost the beacon of hope for the democratic movement in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, but Thailand has a lot of strengths. Uh, just Bangkok is probably one of the most exciting, dynamic cities in the region, mm -hmm. much more than any of the capitals of, the, of, of Southeast Asia. Uh, so it gives that kind of leadership. You know, lots of investors come here. What about you, Nemo? What's Thailand's position in ASEAN? I think uh, Thailand uh, has a lot going for it. Thailand is, uh, you know, is a, such a huge export manufacturing and export hub for, for the region. Um, it also has some drawbacks. And I think um, a lot of the analysts and experts have talked about how Thailand is kind of losing its competitive edge slowly. It's having, it will have to work harder mm -hmm. to stay in place or to get ahead because there are other people coming up. You mentioned Burma, uh, Myanmar. That's a long way off, I think, for Myanmar to actually compete with Thailand, etc. It's a little bit in the future. But there's Vietnam, there's Indonesia, as Marwan said. Uh, you know, these are competitive yes. uh, So how should Thailand keep pace with other countries moving on in ASEAN? Well, one of the things is to reform the education system, reform and modernize education, okay, which has been talked about for a long time. But not much has happened in that regard. Then um, strengthen infrastructure and strengthen... R&D, 
Mm. So that there's more value added mm -hmm. in Thailand, but Thailand moves up the value chain. Very much like Singapore has been doing. But like Singapore, right, exactly, exactly. And I think Thailand has a lot of strengths again in terms of its pool of uh, skilled labor, which you don't have in mm -hmm. a country like Vietnam. But if there's repeated problems in Thailand, political mm -hmm. or disasters or whatever you may call them, then that position of Thailand will be slightly affected, negatively mm -hmm. affected. Yes. You've been in Thailand for nearly a decade. What do you see as strength of Thai people or Thai society? Uh, well, I think uh, Thailand has an, an amazing capacity, the Thais have an amazing capacity for flexibility. For instance, th foreigners, Westerners, not Asians, right? Uh -huh. Westerners will say, oh, Thais have no principles, right? They, uh, you know, they say one thing today, uh, something tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, that doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound good on one on, at one level. But actually, it's one of Thailand's strengths. Mm -hmm. In other words, it has a capacity for flexibility. So, given a problem, it can think outside the box, or can think in a Thai way uh -huh. that might find a resolution, which uh, might not be might not be welcome from a Western perspective. So that's one of Thailand's strengths, you know, this amazing capacity for flexibility uh, to respond and not be driven by ideology and principle, mm -hmm. but as much as, well, you know, how will we Thais solve the problem? Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, uh, you know, people can suffer for it also, you know, I mean, that's the yeah. other side of it. Double eight sword. How do you think, do you agree with Marwan, Nimo? Yeah, I think so. I think absolutely. That, that's that's a, a positive, the uh, ability to adapt and the ability to sort of muddle through, people say. Mm -hmm. Thailand has a capacity to muddle through. Mm -hmm. That's basically adapting and improvising. And Thailand also has another great advantage, which is that it has a very positive brand image mm -hmm. overseas. Now, you see this with tourism. Tourism gets hit when there's riots in Bangkok or when there's some disaster somewhere and it bounces back remarkably fast. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of goodwill for Thailand. Thailand has a very positive image. It's suffering, it has suffered a bit in the last few years because of the political turmoil. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's a long way from being the sick man of Asia, a long way. With the work of foreign journalists, especially last year with the riot which has happened and foreign journalists were criticized a lot as do not really understand the situation of Thai politics, how would you like to respond to that? Well, I think it is very difficult. Uh, we're looking at different media. First of all, you're looking, looking at television media and you have uh, big networks and they're constrained in their like, as you know from television. You're constrained to maybe 60 seconds or 120 seconds, two minutes. And you have to tell the whole story, the whole background of Thai politics in two minutes and report what's happening in front of you. And it's very tough because of the complexity. Now, we being in print, we have the luxury of more space. I can put three or four paragraphs. And generally, when I write a Thai political story, at least 40 to 50 percent of this of the story is backgrounding so yes it is half challenging of it. yeah almost half i would say sometimes half so it is a challenge because there are so many nuances mm -hmm. and you have to explain them so um, you know i'm prepared to believe that in some cases the foreign the foreign media had to fall short because of space because of uh, you know all these constraints and because depends on your audience as well. If you, there's a tendency among some networks, for example, to oversimplify. Mm -hmm. Be again, because it's a, it's a product of various factors. You have to explain to your editors what's happening, the sub-editors. And uh, they often come back to us with questions, to come, come back to me with questions. Now, that to me is an, indi is an indicator. I learn from that because if a sub-editor asks me a question, it's the kind of question a reader would ask. Mm -hmm. So you have to explain it. Okay. So sometimes you have to explain things which appear obvious and yet at the same time you can't oversimplify because that would be making a complex thing, you know, doing it injustice. And Marwan, do you think foreign journalists has to do much more homework in trying to understand what's going on in Thailand? Well, yeah, certainly because, you know, Thailand has all the institutions of a modern democracy, like a parliament, uh, as a functioning judiciary and all that. But uh, once you've spent years in this country, you realize that actually th there, are two, there are two Thailands on the political landscape. There is a, there is a functioning Thailand, or democratic culture that everybody can see, but you realize that a lot of political decisions are made behind the scenes. You know, it's 
it's power politics that is not accountable for. Uh, it's power politics of backroom deals. Mm -hmm. And, it, and so just because uh, the current government has 300 seats in parliament and a comfortable majority, you get the impression that the government is looking behind its back for the challenges from these extra parliamentary forces. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones who determine the country's agenda. So, Isn't it general for other countries too? Well, not in the way Thailand has it. I mean, in Thailand's case, uh, you, you, know, you can't criticize those extra parliamentary forces. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are very powerful. And, they have, and that's why, even though you have a comfortable majority, uh, you know, you're constantly negotiating how to please those people. Mm -hmm. So when you come as a new reporter, these things, these nuances you might miss, right? Uh, but then gradually after you've been here for longer, you find, you realize that, well, it's a, the politics of clans. Mm -hmm. Thailand is a politics of clans, politics of backroom deals. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then you have the lovely expression, Thai-style democracy, uh -huh. which you know, some Thais passionately want to de defend and other Thais say it's backward. So, you know, it's, I think it's a great story to, to follow, but the challenge is how you tell this complex story uh, to a, an audience. That's mm. the challenge. So, mm. you know, you've got to find the right person, the right story to get that uh, narrative out. What do you look forward to as a professional and personally in your life next year? Well, next year, I, I think politics will become uh, more interesting, also more challenging because, it's, again, as, as we've been talking about, it's very dense and deceptive in Thailand. So that will be a challenge. So I look forward to seeing what will happen after this emergency, flood emergency is over, the holiday period is over, then it comes back to the main political agendas, you know, which is going to be challenging, certainly. And personally, I, I always look forward to traveling around the country more and seeing new places and writing on things other than politics. Okay. Write about social issues, trends, you know, uh -huh. development issues, things like that. That's yes. interesting. You, Marwan? I think uh, what happens in May next year will be interesting when mm -hmm. the 111 MPs on the Thai, Thai party were banned. Mm -hmm. uh, can return because you know sometimes when you listen, when you follow the current government of Prime Minister Yingluck, it's a bit surreal. You know, I mean, she was just plucked out from nowhere by her brother to fit a role, and it's interesting to see her struggle through it. Mm -hmm. uh, the people she's surrounded with, some of them are completely incompetent, right, and are lacking skills in governance. But they have managed to hold the party together. They may argue back. <laughs> they have held the party together and, you know, won the elections. And, mm -hmm. you know, in May, it will be almost one year, right? Mm -hmm. So it will be very interesting to see when the 111 come back, who is going to, who will give up their seats, who will give up their cabinet minister positions, how many of them will be returned. So within the, within Thaksin's political camp, there is going to be, a lot of divisions that are going to emerge and that would be a story to follow. We mark it on the calendar and see how it goes to next year in 2012. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your revision you. of this year 2011 for us for Top Jot. และทั้งหมดคือตอบโจทย์สำหรับคืนนี้นะคะมุมมองผู้สื่อข่าวต่างชาติต่อเหตุการณ์การเมืองและสังคมที่เกิดขึ้นในประเทศไทยค่ะในรอบปีที่ผ่านมาชนัทธาโกมลวาทินสวัสดีค่ะ